Yes. Can I give hey, you a question? They say we're live, so anytime they go. Okay. I'm sure we were actually live too. Thank you. This stays on this time. Hi, everybody. I'm Cece Collins. I'm the president of the Little Miami River Chamber Alliance. And uh, thank you all for being here. We know this is an important... Okay, I don't think I have to fight with it anymore. Thanks, David. So, again, I'm Cece Collins um, with the Little Miami River Chamber Alliance. We cover Loveland Sims in Miami Township. And on behalf of myself, um, our staff, which is myself and then Meredith Taylor, who's sitting right here, and our board of directors, um, we want to thank everybody for being here, especially all of you. Uh, we feel it's important for everyone to make a good, informed vote. And so we put the forum on so that you can hear from our candidates, look them in the eye, hear what they have to say on different topics. So thank you all. I'd like a, a round of applause for our candidates for being here. And for all of you. Just a quick bit of information on how this runs. Um, and we have done this with the school district before. We did um, last Thursday the city council for Loveland. And um, we're going to run it very similar. So each candidate gets two minutes to introduce themselves, two minutes to answer um, questions, and then two minutes for a conclusion or a whatever you want to call it, a, a last statement, if you will. So um, we have an MC here. I'm going to bring him up here in a minute. And um, we'll keep time. I, they, they know how it's going to go. So we really ask you guys to be respectful. I know everyone's. Um, very passionate about a lot of different topics. I am as well. But that's not what this is about for you all to um, interact with our candidates at this time. 
I think there'll be other opportunity to do that, and they're certainly welcome to stick around till the end and um, talk to folks if they choose to. Um, tonight, we have um, topics. We have questions that have been submitted through our online portal, and then we had a um, basket over here. So we have a good amount of questions. We have a lot. So we try not to ask too many questions about one topic. We try to be fair about the questions, cover a lot of different topics. So we ask you to just kind of sit back and listen tonight and listen to what all the candidates have to say. Whether you agree or not, that's up to you, and that helps you uh, form an opinion to make an informed vote. So, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to stay on time, and with that said, I'm going to bring up our MC, Ricky Mulvey. Hope I didn't mess hear your name. Come on up. Okay. You can fix that. So thank you, Ricky, for being here. All right, my goal is to get this moving as quickly as possible. My name is Ricky Mulvey. I graduated from Loveland in 2014. Uh, I produced the Simply Money radio show here in town on 55KRC. And uh, looking forward to helping moderate this debate. With that out of the way, we'll start with our candidate. Not the debate. You guys knew what I was saying, right? That was like a synonym. It wasn't an answer, but close enough. Coming up first to introduce yourself, Colette Boyko. that is 
happened in the past, it's not only just the communication part, it's also active listening. It's not just what somebody says, but how are people interpreting it and being thoughtful with our words. So that is one thing that I feel is very important that I would it, am planning on bringing to the table. Fiscal responsibility. For the past two years, that has been something that I've been working towards with this community. Just being aware that there is a huge economic diversity in the city of Loveland, in our community, and making sure that all of our citizens are represented when it comes to the school board and fiscal uh, aspects of that. So first of all, I forgot to say this at the beginning, thank you Local Magazine and Chamber for hosting this event. I think this is a big part of the community in being able to have knowledge, be able to see us all up here. Um, so when you have in closing, my, when you have the right superintendent and when you have the right Board of Education, I believe good things can happen. So Mr. Broadwater is the right superintendent and tonight you get to choose who that is going to be. Thank you. So for me, this is about finishing what I think of as five main things. Uh, first of all, it's continuing the financial stability that we've actually created in the last year until we can get to whenever the next levy occurs. Number two, uh, it's the ongoing rebuilding of it's, it's the ongoing rebuilding of community trust. Three, district leadership. Not something that's normally talked about, but it's about settling and developing the key slots of superintendent and treasurer. Very, very important for the operation of the district in the future. Number four, we've got to finally get through these unpre unprecedented COVID challenges that have affected deeply the education of our kids. So we can then fi finally shift our focus, finally shift our focus back to our kids, their dreams, and our dreams for all of them tomorrow. I intend to be as brief as I can tonight. Um, I've set up a website um, cleverly called kevind.org, K-E-B-I-N-D.org, and it's got a ton more information. I think it'll probably cover everything that we're likely to talk about tonight, but I'm going to try to be brief. So I'm a retired business guy. Uh, in the business world, I have responsibility for literally thousands of people and billions of, of dollars. And the only thing that's relevant about that is that managing the problems that we have here in Loveland actually kind of feels familiar to me. This is stuff that I think we've done a lot of, and it gives me the confidence that they are very solvable types of problems. Uh, I'm not an education expert, but that's why the board hired Mike Broadwater, who's prepared his entire life to be our superintendent. If you haven't met Mike, you should, and you'll be very impressed with it. I should say that the district, sorry, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> city and for our country and so so grateful that you're all here invested in this process. I'm uh, running for the board because I've raised my kids here in Loveland. They've been well prepared for their future and I think every kid deserves that, both the kids that are in school now and the kids that will come after them. And the Board of Education should be a safeguard for the educational mission of our district as well as advocates for continuous improvements to facilities, resources, making sure that our, our teachers have the administrative support that they need to do their jobs well. Education is something that we need a, a, a complex uh, combination of interests to come together in order to look to the future and all of the needs that all of our students have in the district. Our current board's done some great things the last couple of years, but there continue to be things that we need to work on, issues of trust, 
and division persist throughout our community and are reflective of larger cultural divides that we see. We got real funding needs in our district that are causing instructional gaps in our classrooms. There's work to do in building consensus around the importance of the mission of our schools and how we're going to fund the continued progress of all of our students. And we can't afford to stand still and maintain what is. We've got to continue to innovate and deepen our academic offerings, prepare our children for the careers of tomorrow. They need our support uh, to thrive socially and academically now more than ever. And I believe that I've got the depth of leadership experience to help the board achieve these goals. And I hope I can count on your vote in November so I can work on supporting this essential work for our community. Thank you. voters usually ask me is this, why am I running? I'm running because I have something special to offer. I'm the only candidate who has experience providing professional communication and community engagement services to school districts. Among these candidates, we have a pastor, a doctor, a teacher, a salesman, paralegal. Shouldn't at least one of the board members be a professional who serves school districts with communication services? I've helped other school districts get better. Now it's time to help my own community but this time in the seat on the school board. My daughter has been in the Lowland School since preschool. She's now in eighth grade. She's received a wonderful education. I want to make sure my daughter and more than 4,000 other students continue to receive a wonderful education. My campaign is about hope, optimism, and restoring trust. This is a great school district, as other people have mentioned, but this district is going through a challenging period. Now the district's number one goal needs to be restoring trust in the leadership. Without trust, the community won't provide enough resources to the district. Without enough resources, the students will not get the education they deserve. I am sure we can turn things around. I've, I've seen other school districts fail two consecutive levies and come back even stronger. In fact, I helped them turn things around. It takes strong leadership. For, de for several decades, I've attended or participated in hundreds of meetings of school boards and local governments in various communities as a news reporter and now as a consultant to school districts. Additionally, I've attended meetings of the local school board as a parent, taxpayer, and now a candidate. I've learned what works and doesn't work in school districts. I will bring those insights and ideas to the local school board. Thank you.
so far we've had a great, a great experience in Loveland. We've had some amazing teachers who have gone to great lengths to make sure that my children have everything they need. Um, why would I choose to run uh, right now <laughs> in such a politically uh, volatile um, climate? Um, that is the question that's been asked of me many times. Um, I really put a lot of thought and prayer into this decision, um, a lot of careful consideration. Uh, I actually interviewed my uncle, who was a superintendent in Columbus for many years, just kind of to pick his brain, what did the school board member actually do? And um, that is uh, one thing that he asked me, was I crazy for wanting to run right now? <laughs> but um, I don't think I'm crazy, I'm actually quite sane, and um, I really have a lot to offer to our community. I am an excellent listener, and I have really, really enjoyed um, getting to hear feedback from community members as I've been going door to door and just going to meet and greets. Hearing your ideas on how we can heal the divide, I mean, everybody here knows our community is extremely divided over multiple issues, financial, social, you name it, there's a huge divide. But when we have face-to-face -face conversations, um, I think that we can learn that we all really want what's best for our children and best for our community. And um, I hope that I can earn your vote uh, by showing that I am an excellent listener and um, I, I can help bridge the divide. So thank you and good luck to everybody. for being here and allowing me to reintroduce myself to you. I'm Eileen Washburn. When I first ran for the board four years ago, it was because I believed my background and experience as an active teacher, involved parent, advocate, and resident would help me make a difference in our schools. I strongly believed in public education, the intellectual empowerment of children of all backgrounds and abilities, and the economic benefit of excellent education. In four years, those strongly held beliefs in public education, our schools, and our students have not changed. But what has changed is that in that time, we've done many great things. Move the bar upwards, and the momentum is moving positively forward. I want to continue to be part of that because I feel I can still contribute a lot to that growth. Experience and expertise have often been portrayed as being inconsequential in this position. However, having a thorough understanding of the role is extremely important to be effective. My priorities are very simple. 
First, to ensure that all students feel safe, seen, and valued so they can achieve to the highest levels they're capable of through a culture of high expectations within an infrastructure of effective and diverse supports and experiences. Education isn't a one-size-fits-all, and it isn't something where we should be going through the motions to check a box. This work is about inclusivity. It's about making sure there's a space where everyone can fit equally and learn. Secondly, I want to continue on the path of increased communication and community engagement. Maintaining focus in this area is imperative. The efforts we've taken towards greater transparency, providing more opportunities for stakeholders to engage, and redesign our tools are all great steps, but they're only steps in a much larger path. Lastly, focus on fiscal responsibility and school funding. I want to continue serving Loveland to ensure quality in education and opportunities for all students. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Um, a quick little reminder to the audience members, if you don't have your phone on silent, please put your phone on silent. Uh, we're working this like a fantasy football snake draft. Colette went first for the introductions. She will go last for the next question. We will start with Anna Bunker with this question from you. Our community is divided. What do you suggest we do to bring it together? Each candidate will have two minutes. So, uh, kind of a difficult question, I think. Uh, for me, it starts with really trying to reach out and make sure that people know that they're being listened to. A lot of the controversy, I think, that we battled this past year uh, has been because people didn't feel that anybody was listening, anybody was caring. Um, and it's, it's tough to make the connection to listen to what literally turns out to be dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of different opinions on some very difficult uh, and controversial subjects that really have no universal answer that everybody will buy into. But I think it starts with an honest attempt to hear everybody. Um, I think it also involves uh, a skill that maybe the board has to relearn. And, and it's what I call being candid. Uh, it's being willing to be vulnerable, to say, I made a mistake, um, I was wrong, um, but I'll continue to tell you what I think, uh, knowing that at some point down the road, you might have to call me on it. Um, but I think with those kinds of interactions, you have the beginnings of trust. And when you have trust, that opens the pathway for communication. Um, I think that, uh, our new superintendent, uh, Mike Broadlord, uh, has actually taken up the mantle uh, of, 
this very early in his, uh, in his tenure. He's developed a comprehensive and professionally managed communication plan that will involve, as it starts to roll out next year, reaching out into the community and hearing what the community really thinks, really is prepared to do uh, before any long-term plans start to be laid down uh, in, in place. Uh, let me leave it there. Thank you. both sides of any issue. And I think we have to realize that it is 
is the silent majority that we need to figure out a way to get involved, to talk through these issues. Nobody is ever going to get what they want. In any negotiation, both sides get usually reasonably dissatisfied. That means it's a relatively good situation for all parties. And I think we have to be pragmatic in that. I am a little bit different in regards to going out and getting somebody from outside the district to come in and be a listener. I've been exposed to so many fantastic people prior to this election and through this election that I think there's enough talent in this community to be able to, to effectively uh, harbor a conversation to figure out what's best for all individuals. There are so many constituents, there's so many people that want something different. The basic tenet is we have children that we need to educate and prepare for the future. Everything else is kind of window dressing in that. But we have to be able to work as a team and to truly get to the bottom of the issues at hand, not necessarily focus on ones that may not be so important to the end goal, and that's preparing our kids for the future.
we were spending your money to try to sell the reason that we needed to spend more of your money. I heard that lesson, and I think that it's, it's I think that we have the time and the talent that the administrative staff that we have here today can produce a grand vision to bring our community back together. And as a board member, that's what I want to support. Thanks. about experience being important in this role. And I don't think that this question is any exception to that because I can tell you from experience that I've learned a lot of what not to do again. So our kids often learn their biggest lessons when they make a mistake. So things that we've done wrong, I've learned from that greatly. How do we bring people back together though and change the divide in the community? This is obviously a top priority for our organization as well as for our community as a whole. So in order to regain and rebuild trust with the broader community, it's imperative that no matter what's going on, we maintain focus in this arena. This is a difficult path. Nobody said it's going to be easy. We need to take the barriers down, put anger aside, and come together. If anyone says they have a silver bullet answer, they're lying to themselves and to you. You simply have to try to be open and honest with the community, to engage the community, to be out in the community, to be available to the community, ask questions, um, seek people out, seek groups out, attend events, and do everything and anything, talk everything and anything possible to be available and to connect to everyone in the community. Bottom line is we need to listen, we need to discuss, we need to collaborate, and you keep doing that until, and then you keep going on again with it. Thank you.
Well, let me, uh, let me put it together this way. The, the, the last levy that we had, I think it was back in, in 2014, um, and I want to believe that actually uh, in um, the November levy attempt, if we had put an operating levy in front of the community and let it stand on its own, that it actually would pass. Why? Because this is a community that, I mean, if you, you just have to walk the streets, you have to, 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 to see parents here at these buildings, this is a community that treasures its young people. And it's always been very proud of its schools. We had a, we had a disconnect, and we have to work our way back from, from that disconnect. I do think that it, that's going to take some time. Uh, and uh, I think you have to have a realistic sense of the, of the, the journey in front of us. Um, you all probably know that 60% or so uh, of our operating uh, revenue comes from property taxes. You probably may not know that the majority of taxpayers don't actually have kids in the schools. So if you're not listening to that part of the, uh, of the population, you're deeply at risk of round three going down without success. Um, I think we may be okay for another year or so, uh, the way we're conserving cash at the moment. I think the district needs that time to continue to heal and to earn the right to go back in front of the community and, and ask for financial help. spending priorities are as a district. And one of the things we've been doing throughout this process, I think one of the good things about this election, having so many people involved in it, is that we've been doing a lot of listening, probably more than we would in previous elections because so many more people have been engaged in, with so many candidates. And there are some themes that we've certainly been hearing. We've been hearing, hearing about concerns about cuts that we've had to make in busing, uh, cuts we've had to make in music, and cuts we uh, had to make in the enrichment programs. Um, Particularly, uh, I've been hearing a lot about the, the gifted programs. Well, part of what I also was hearing last night when we were at the board meeting and listening to the, the, the uh, principals from all of the different uh, buildings talking about what's going on in instruction in their rooms, particularly in all of their classes, particularly post-COVID, uh, is all of the intervention work that is going to be so necessary with the, the gap that's happened um, in instruction because of the, the, the pandemic. And so we're investing more of our dollars right now. Some of those ESSER funds that, that came from the, the federal relief are now being invested in intervention in our schools. I don't see that, that uh, um, disappearing soon, particularly when we look at those that are more socioeconomically disadvantaged in our community. Uh, that's where we're seeing the largest gap. And uh, we need to continue to invest so that every student has the opportunity for success in Loveland. And so we've got to come together and build that consensus as a community starting now about why we need to invest. Look at everything. If there are other places to cut, great. But we know we've already done a lot of that work. Um, and a number of those cuts, a, a lot of people feel, have gone too deep and are hurting our kids in our schools. So we've got to begin to cons uh, build that consensus for how we're going to support our district. To me, it's not up to the board, it's not up to the administration to decide how to fund the schools or what level. It's up to the community, and I really mean that. When we have an organized listening program, we're going to find out what the community really wants. Will they support bringing back high school busing? My daughter's in eighth grade, we're going to be driving her to high school next year if there's no busing. But it's not up to me, it's not up to the board of administration. The community has to decide what the schools should be like. We're talking about restoring teaching positions. There's been cuts in the gifted position, art and music. Again, we need to ask the community what they want. We only want to go back on the ballot with a levy when we're sure it will pass, and there's a way to do that. I've seen it in other communities. The scientific survey, the professional poll, will tell us what will pass. Just a few of my priorities, personally, things I like, but things that we have to ask the community about, art and music, they were cut. It's really important. All day kindergarten, we have it now. It just shows what can happen with existing funds. The district did not spend more money to bring 
all day kindergarten to the district that just wisely reassigned um, a teacher to a different level. I also happen to like applied learning. The district is doing a wonderful job at creating more opportunities for hands-on learning, experiential learning for students. There was just a, several of them mentioned at last night's board meeting. And the last, social emotional learning is crucial. Students cannot learn if they're having behavioral problems. The district has resources for that. I love that, and they also have outside resources to help students learn better. Thank you. So I may look at this a little bit differently. Um, we have a $56 million budget. Uh, in $56 million, I have to believe there's some fat in that budget. Uh, are we utilizing all the resources that we have? Uh, are we going and, and do, uh, uh, when we go to, to bid things out, how do we bid it? Are we looking at public and private? I think you really have to take a look item by item through the budget. And I agree with Kevin, we've got to have a treasurer that's, that's responsible and does a good job and puts that in order with us. Um, I don't know that the Loveland schools are going backwards. I mean, we've definitely had some cuts. And I think that the kids have gone through hell in the last few years with this COVID situation. And from a standpoint of the social and emotional side, we certainly have to work with them on that. But from a, from a fiscal conservative and the, the son of a depression era dad, I always look at you, you, you can only spend what you have. And I think we have to look at the budget and really scour through it and find out where we can find some savings. For example, school busing is four hundred thousand dollars for high school busing. That's what I was. That's what I found out. Four hundred thousand dollars on fifty-six million. That was a gotcha to the parents, in my opinion, because levies didn't pass. I don't think you do those things. I think you have to listen to what the community wants. We have to look at our budgets. We have to see where the fat is, and then we have to determine the priorities for our children going forward. Thank you so much. So I'm a fiscal conservative. I think it's extremely important that we work within our means. Every family here, representative, uh, every, year, every family here has to work within their own budget. Um, the school does too. You know, we have a budget of 55, 56, million dollars, um, we can work with that and still provide an excellent education for our students. Um, how do we continue to do that? Well, it's back to communication. Just in my um, going door to door and talking to the community, I've received a ton of really great ideas on how we can be even more responsible with the needs that we are working with. Um, in regards to busing, um, someone presented the idea that we do an analysis, how many high school students actually need a bus? And um, the number was presented that it may be somewhere closer to 25 or 28 percent of the students actually need a bus. So perhaps we could um, uh, think about uh, the bus routes and, and um, not need as many bus drivers for the high schools. Maybe we don't need $400,000 to bring back buses for high school students. Um, but uh, as a conservative, I think there's room to cut back. Um, and uh, we, we really need to create a transparent budgeting process. Uh, we can conduct an outside performance audit, audit surveying the community, asking for their uh, percentage of annual pay raises, level of employer paid benefits, and match those pay and benefits to district personnel pay raises and uh, benefits. 83% of our budget is going towards teacher salaries and benefits. And it is important that we prepare our teachers competitively, um, but some of the benefits that we're giving um, are way higher than what our community members receive, and there's some resentment there. Um, so I think it's only fair that uh, that our, our, our teachers and staff will be on par with the average of what our community receives. Um, also, there's ways to increase our income, um, for example, through an end, uh, earned income tax, as opposed to just a flat income to in, income tax. If we, oh, thank you. <laughs> Kevin Dory and I have been intimately involved with the finance committee. We've watched our administration 
um, you know, tremendous gains in efficiencies. We were doing things that, quite frankly, at points seemed silly, and we've identified those and gotten rid of them. Um, I've been the liaison of the board to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission's done tremendous work. Um, the Finance Committee of the Planning Commission broke down all of our expenses compared to other school districts and looked at where we were an outlier. Um, Elizabeth's right in identifying the fact that benefits for public school employees in the teaching world are different than benefits in the private world, but that's who we compete against. So if we cut those benefits, teachers go someplace else because it's a really easy decision. Um, but our biggest outlier was in the overall rate of pay in our teaching staff. And um, with, in conjunction with the teaching staff and in partnership with the teaching staff, because they had identified that as a community concern as well. At great personal expense to themselves, um, we negotiated a contract which involved both a 0% base increase over two years and changing our step formula from a 20-year step formula, which got teachers to the bottom right, the highest salary level within 20 years, to a 27-step formula. I probably lost everybody here, but uh, that's what I spent over 200 hours doing last year. Um, our, our benefits for our administrators, slightly out of whack, small amount of money, we fixed it going forwards. Um, we started investing excess cash. How much does that get us a year? $50,000? Not a lot, but we'll look, for, we'll look for quarters under the couch cushions that we have. Thanks. community engagement in its more recent fiscal history. It's also a fact that the district is operating at a level that many parents believe is below where it should be due to cuts in teachers, programs, and services. And the current surplus that we currently see because of COVID funds will soon be decreasing. So funding issues will undoubtedly be part of the next four years. So stewardship is imperative to ensure operational stability today and in the future. So some ways that I would like to look into, and again, as several of my colleagues up here have said, it's about communication, but things that I've heard from the community look into a personal income tax rather than just having a levy on, um, based off of property tax. Um, other options, there are different firms out there where they find millions and millions of dollars for schools, for busing, for music programs, for other programs of that nature that would help enhance, that wouldn't cost the district money. So I think that there are some creative ways to bring some of the funding back through other organizations. Um, it will take work, it will take time, it will take communication and collaboration, but I do also think that we need to involve everyone and be fiscal stewards and make sure that we're doing what's best for the students, the teachers, as well as the community to move in the right direction. Thank you. Because look at everybody here, 
And if we all put our minds together and find ways to do other kinds of funding, whether it be corporate or special programs, I think we can do it. I mean, I go up to other schools and I see um, big corporate sponsors. Um, so how can we do that here to get some of the extras that maybe we can't afford with the tax base? Thank you.
Thanks. I have several points I want to make about critical race theory. I've done a lot of reading about critical race theory. I've participated in a webinar with college professors as panelists. I know of no place in Ohio public schools where it's part of the curriculum, number one. Number two, it wouldn't make sense for it to be part of the pre-K through 12, uh, 12, 12th grade curriculum. It's an approach that's used in graduate schools and law schools. Number three, it wouldn't make sense for a critical race theory to be part of the curriculum for another reason. Teachers feel great pressure to teach what will be on standardized tests. CRT is not part of standardized tests. Four, and I think this is most important because it comes from my heart, with every fiber of my being, I believe the role of a public school teacher is to expose students to a variety of viewpoints and let the students decide what makes sense to them, what to embrace. A good teacher does not insist that students think a certain way. A good teacher fosters robust discussion and critical thinking and lets the students decide what to accept and adopt. A great example in Loveland, in the Loveland curriculum that's also part of the state of Ohio's curriculum, is world religions in sixth grade. They learn about Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and more. Public school teachers aren't trying to convert them to a different religion. They don't tell them that one religion is the right religion. They're just helping students learn about the differences and similarities among the religions. My last point, Loveland school policy states, quote, it is the responsibility of the teacher to make certain that access to materials presenting various sides of an issue is available. To sum up, Loveland teachers are required to present various points of view, and that's the way it should be. truth 
Oh, and is it here? Um, our staff went through um, uh, professional development. Uh, the title is called a deep dive into white supremacy. So is it actually being taught? I don't know, but the staff are receiving training in, in these kind of dangerous ideology, and I will not support that. Um, also, um, the Ohio Department of Education has resources to teach the 1619 Project, which is full of historical inaccuracy.
So as you may have heard from a few people, CRT is currently not being taught in our schools, <laughs> um, nor should it be taught, just to be clear. Um, I have been blessed with the teachers that my children have had so far that they, and I think this is really important to remember, that the teachers' role with regards to our students in what it means to be a role model of just being a good person, just having good values, being um, respectful of one another, of kids and their classmates. I've seen that firsthand in the teachers that my students have, or my children have had. Um, that may not be the case for everybody, but I think that is kind of a basic um, prerequisite for a teacher to model those behaviors and also for teachers to facilitate these types of discussions in a safe environment. Um, it doesn't mean that they're teaching them. I think a lot of the, pol the politics, um, personally, I don't think my children should know or be able to tell what a teacher's political affiliations are. Um, I think that should be left up to the student, their parents, their communities, their core group of people around them. But um, again, just having the teachers facilitate being that role model, showing what it is just, like said, just to be a good human being. CRT is actually pretty easy. Uh, I don't see that it's helped any issue that I can see. I consider it to be a highly divisive term. It's not part of our curriculum. It hasn't been suggested that it should be part of our curriculum. And as a result, I just can't envision us ever going down a road that divisive. Having said that, uh, there are some other things that we should be sensitive to. We need, for example, to recognize that different kids have different needs. Our family is heavily involved in trying to improve the future for young people on the autism spectrum. If you're interested in knowing more about that, but look up XPATH program at Xavier University. That's what we've been doing. Through that work, it sensitized me to differences in people. So I do tend to pay a little extra attention to the issues of our kids that are challenged in one way or another. This is very real to us. We should be true to an idea that every child matters, and we should do everything within our resources to help them individually succeed. I think we have a sacred responsibility to do this kind of thing. Um, especially as it relates in our district, it tends to be the kids that are financially challenged or special needs kids who have the poorest performing um, results uh, in, in the district. We do need to stop and understand how we can have an impact on the futures and the successes of those young lives. Thank you. All right, we've got the hot button questions. No comment closing statements. Two minutes per candidate. We will start with Elliot. Responsibility several times tonight. In fact, it's probably more than several times. Of course, the candidates want fiscal responsibility, and that includes me. If there is a candidate who doesn't believe in fiscal responsibility, they shouldn't be running. I want to make uh, I want to emphasize three things about my candidacy. First, I want the schools to thrive, but I'm not going to make decisions with just the students in mind. I will always make decisions with the best interest of the students and the taxpayers. Second, I have decades of knowledge and experience with school districts. I'm the only candidate with professional experience providing communication and community engagement services to school districts. I've helped school districts improve their relationships with their communities, and that's exactly what Loveland needs now. And finally, I have a plan to bring this divided community together. It involves a highly organized listening program with a neutral facilitator, 
followed by a professional poll to decide whether a levy could pass. I don't want us going back to the ballot unless we know a levy could pass. If you want to know more about my candidacy, please go to votegrossman.com. That's votegrossman.com. I know what needs to be done to move this district forward. I have the experience, the determination, and the ability to listen to the community. I hope you'll vote for me. I'd like to thank you all for coming and for watching tonight and for hosting this. It's been great to be with you guys. Um, I'd like to thank the teachers. The teachers have a, in some cases, a very rewarding, but in some cases, a very thankless job. I know I'm not built to be a teacher. Uh, I'm, I've been a coach. I love kids. I'm passionate about our community and our country. Um, and that's why I've gotten involved in this race. I think back to my first three teachers I had, Ms. Dorlane in first grade, Mrs. Mickich in second grade, and Mrs. Bosch in third grade. My dad traveled a lot, and I was a withdrawn kid, very shy. And they helped bring me, they helped bring my inner side out where I was actually not the shy kid anymore. I still remember that. I'm 53 years old. Teachers are a very special part of all of our lives, throughout all of our lives. And I am doing, running for office, which I never thought I would do, and the next office I'll run for will be dog catcher, but <laughs> I just believe in my heart that I, it's up, it's time for me to give my time and my talents to the children of this school district. And it's, I'm a passionate guy, I'm a straightforward guy, I get that from my mother, and I just hope that you'll support me, and uh, I'd be honored to have your vote on November 2nd, and I look forward to the opportunity to help serve this fantastic community, all parts of the community. Every child, uh, it, it was said a moment ago, Every child is a gift of God. Every child is very important. And um, I just appreciate the opportunity very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate everyone coming out here. Um, so I would just pose a question. What makes an effective board member? I think an effective board member is someone who has excellent decision-making skills, and someone who is an excellent listener. And I possess both of those qualities. And I would be honored to serve our community, to hear what our community wants, and to make excellent decision skills. I am willing to put forth the time and the effort to do the research to, uh, to make sure that we are making wise decisions for our district, to be accountable to our taxpayers, to be accountable to our students, to provide an excellent education. So I'll just make this very short and sweet. I would really love to earn your votes on November 2nd. So please remember Elizabeth Mason, and be sure to go out and vote. <laughs> but if you're out here, I'm sure that you will if you're, if you're active, uh, actively engaged. Um, if you have any further questions, I am going to stick around. I'm happy to, to answer your questions. And also check out um, my website, which I share with Alan Collette, who decided to run as a slate um, for three conservatives. Um, and uh, our website is www.4lovelykids.com. Thank you very much.
for video conference technology. Uh, the high school kids who, because of quarantine rules, couldn't come back were getting a full-time curriculum by the use of our teachers working ridiculously hard teaching people both in person and remotely at the same time. So they didn't get a half-time curriculum, which was the initial discussions. Um, I've used my medical background to help to strategically plan for healthy learning in the future. We're not going to be rid of respiratory viruses. We're not going to be rid of COVID ever. It's going to be coming around and around, hopefully at lesser and lesser degrees over time. So how do we keep a healthy environment for our kids? I will continue to build trust, transparency, and continue to work on fiscal responsibility. I want to be here so that I can help us to pass a levy in the future, get our system back on track, and replace the losses that we've had. Thanks.
I've spent the last couple years advocating on behalf of the entire community for fiscal responsibility. I've also interviewed for the interim um, Board of Education positions that Mr. Jory and Mr. Schultz have all now filled. So I did interview for that and also for the Planning Commission. So this is not a responsibility that I take lightly. This is something that I've been preparing for and researching and advocating for for the past two years. I will be an independent voice. Um, I will do my research. I will make sure that I'm prepared. I will advocate on behalf of our entire community and most importantly, our students. Um, that's not just within this, within Loveland, that's also at the state and federal level because that, that piece of it cannot be left behind and that's gonna take an entire community to get that fixed. And I also will work as a team with fellow board members and school administration to ensure that our students receive a quality education that prepares all students to be successful in their endeavors after their time in the Loveland schools. Again, my name is Anna Bunker, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 7th.
so it's understanding how you can work within the system that you have to obtain the best results for the kids. Uh, I recently served on the Wittenberg board for 12 years, was the chair of that board for three years, uh, because people recognize I build consensus when I'm in a leadership role, um, I'm not easily flappable in the midst of tough situations, and I help an organization to move forward. So I would appreciate your support in this election uh, to serve this board. I, I was at the meeting last night on the board and I was just energized by what I heard there, all of the challenges that are there. Uh, I feel like I've got a lot to offer to help the board do the critical thinking it needs to do to move our district. as we felt was fair without taking up your whole evening. Um, really quick, <clears throat> pardon me, I, I, I want to thank the candidates first of all, but I specifically want to um, first um, say something to Kevin, um, Eileen, and Eric. Sorry you didn't get the right name tags. So I mean that, I don't know. I mean, this much Right, right, yeah, so, so no advice there. Just, I, I, I apologize on behalf that you did not get the right name tags. So, but if we could um, seriously give all the candidates a big round of applause. Thank you for putting up with the yellow paper and the red paper. And yes, Kevin, I forgot to put up the 30 seconds. So sorry about that. I wasn't watching. Wait a minute. All right. Um, thank you to Lovell Magazine. And um, Rick, if you could come up, I, you know, I know you're, you're young and making a go of it, so I just want to stand up and give Ricky a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, David Miller. Thank you, Meredith Taylor. And um, I did hear some of the candidates say they would stick around and answer some questions. So um, if you have questions for them, if you don't want to stick around, throw it out the door now. <laughs> but again, thank you all for being here. Hopefully you got some answers to some questions and you can make it a really informed vote come November. Thanks again. Have a great night.